Hello everyone, my name is Steve Goodwin and you are watching my Anchor video number 108. In it, we will examine my testing of this 45 pound Mantis M2 Anchor. It did come out at 44 pounds on my scale and in the setting position, the tip came out at 20 pounds for a tip to total weight ratio of 45%. Remember the highest tip to total weight ratios of any anchors I've tested uh, are the roll bar Mantis anchors and they run as high as 50%. Mantis M2 anchors are a two-piece design. The shank is simply cut from steel plate and it is a very high grade steel. And I'll mention that the scantlings are plenty generous. We've got plenty of height, good and wide, and it's a pretty short lever arm. So I have no problem with the strength of these shanks. The fluke is made from two pieces. Uh, basically the forward half is cast and you can see some roughness. I imagine this is a sand casting, kind of a high volume item, so it's not very precise. And indeed, the opening or the slot that the shank fits into is, you know, it's not a, partic a particularly precise fit. I will say that once you get the bolt in and all snugged up, it does force the shank over to one side. Now on the smaller 17 pound Mantis M2 that I featured previously, even after tightening the bolt, there was a bit of wiggling in the up and down mo motion, uh, but that's not the case with this one. Uh, this anchor, once everything gets bolted up, seems to lock in quite firm. Now I believe the idea with the design of the shank connection is that this notch takes the majority of the stress when uh, under a normal load. However, the bolt does receive some shear, and unfortunately they've used a bolt that is not a smooth shank. We see threads all the way, and in the case of the smaller Mantis M2 anchor, after fairly high pull testing over a thousand pounds, I noticed that the threads had actually dug into and deformed the galvanizing in the hole. Now I don't see that with the bigger anchor. However, I've only pulled with the same force, just over a thousand pounds. So, uh, you know, it's a bigger bigger surface area and we didn't, didn't get any indentation. Later when I start pulling harder, maybe we'll start to see something. Um, in any case, a, a better solution would be a smooth shank bolt, but they are just hard to come by. To get the, the exact length of smooth followed by threads in just the right place, that almost sounds like a custom machine shop job. In any case, it is generously sized. Uh, it's a 5 8 inch bolt, and while someday maybe these threads may sort of flatten out, I think it's highly unlikely that you would shear this bolt. Given the imprecise nature of the fluke to shank connection, I thought there might be a chance that the fluke wasn't well aligned with the shank. So I went ahead and laid out a center line based on the two edges of the fluke. And I found that the end of the shank is only a little less than 3 16 of an inch or maybe about four millimeters uh, off center line. And my guess is that is not an issue. The anchor did receive a thorough jostling in my cobblestone seabed test. Uh, that's the test where if a galvanizing is going to have problems, it'll show up there. And I can report that only one spot has a, a piece of galvanizing missing. It's right there on the fluke. And frankly, I think there might have been a glob or I don't, I don't know how galvanizing process works, but um, it seemed like there was maybe something there that shouldn't have been there under the galvanizing. Uh, in any event, everywhere else, all these leading edges, everything's intact. Uh, part of the success of that is likely due to the well-chamfered corners everywhere, all over the anchor. There's just not one place where there's a hard edge corner. The chain attach hole can accommodate likely shackle sizes. Here's a 3 8 shackle. Fits no problem with no binding. Here's a 7 16 No binding. And even a big half-inch shackle fits no problem, no binding. I'll mention that the new category where I test an anchor's self-launching power, this anchor is at the top of the pack. Uh, this, this angle and the way the weight is distributed, it has a ton of self-launching power. There'll never be a need to give this a kick or a shove to launch. Okay, that's enough shop talk. Let's get out onto the water and see how the anchor performs.
Okay, we'll get things started with a veering test in the loose sand seabed. I am ramping up power to a baseline pull of 840 pounds. And when I get there, I then allow the boat to start swinging to port this time. It'll be veering about two knots. I'll let it swing through 180 degrees. We are watching the playback here at eight times normal speed. And the anchor's forward motion is very little. It's doing, doing real well. It's just basically pivoting around, just a tiny bit of forward motion. I think the anchor is uh, basically in the lower part of the screen, or the anchor shank. The boat is toward the lower part of the screen. Again, it's moving to port. I think that line in the sand that's just below the tether, that's about where the shank is, and it's moving. the shank's moving mostly sideways. Once the boat gets through 180 degrees, I stop moving... I stop the boat's sideways motion and then ramp up power to the max the boat can pull, which is at 1,150 pounds. And it's very good, just a tiny little bit of motion. I've only tested a few of the larger sized anchors here. Uh, the Knox and the Viking were the other two, and this is as good as those others. On retrieval, it was very difficult to pull uh, out of the seabed. Um, the road's almost straight up and down, and you can see I have it's pulling in the opposite direction. Took a lot of force, and the anchor was very well buried. Now, normally on these veer tests, seabed impacts into the side of the fluke on sort of the side that the veer was, was happening. And in this case, there should be more seabed on the right, but in fact, there's more seabed on the left side. It's all good from the top side. Oddly, mud is still on the, the starboard side, even though we veered to port. Now that's weird. Next test is in the cobblestone seabed. My strategy for testing here is to use enough chain, uh, lots of chain, so in effect we have an infinite scope. I don't ever want to see this chain lifting up off from the seabed, get nice apples to apples comparisons, even if I'm using a different boat. And this is pretty typical. The anchors normally take a while before they find just the right rock to get their toe under. I cut out a bunch of that. Let's just get right to the punchline. This is up at the higher the higher uh, pull that this anchor can, can do here. And this, I, I must say, is very, very good. There's only one anchor that does better. That was that recently tested 51-pound Viking. It held uh, quite a bit more than this. But uh, So this is the number two anchor uh, for this cobblestone seabed here. And it's pretty clear what makes an anchor work. And it's a really tall shank. Because the, the horizontal part of these shanks, it's impossible for any anchor to get that to force down through the rocks. So by having that horizontal part of the shank really high means the fluke can penetrate really deeply. So 500 pounds is what it would hold. And then bumped up to 580, things start to, to move. But uh, that, that's, that's very good. I went ahead and uh, let it drag and pull out and then... Uh, did it again. I just let it let it reset, and it repeated the exact same performance. And for this seabed, it, it, it's remarkable how consistent the results are. For many of the anchors, I've done multiple tests, and I just get very consistent holding power each and every time. And here it is again. We were at 500, and now I'm up to 580, and it just does the exact same thing. It's pretty clear that the best case is to avoid this kind of seabed, but if you couldn't, uh, you know, this anchor is actually good enough to, you know, with a decent forecast and an anchor drag alarm, you could sleep pretty, pretty soundly. Missing galvanizing. One spot. Not bad. Next is a veering test in the soft mud at Scow Bay. Now I've chosen to use a 500 pound baseline pulling force for the large anchors here in this seabed. Uh, this is only the third anchor that's been tested as such. 
and it, it has a little trouble. It, it really can't hold the, the 500 pound baseline well. You can see I'm, I'm getting up close to the 500 pounds here. We're never going to see the bottom on, on any of these pictures, but if you look at the camera tethers, they're now sort of moving downward. Well, that's actually the, the anchor moving and the, the water force on the camera is pushing the camera rearward with respect to the anchor. But didn't 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 really hold the 500 pounds and then I started the veer and right away within about 10 or 20 degrees of veering the boat speed increased beyond two knots and I chopped the power and discontinued the test the other two 45 pound range anchors that I've tried to do this veering test with uh, were the Knox and the Viking and they both did much better once again we see mud on just one side of the fluke Next is a repeat of the veer in the soft mud, but I'm going to try it to port this time. And uh, right away I can see that it won't hold the 500 pounds. There's a constant motion, even in a straight line. So then I knock down the power down to 395 pounds and then commence that veer, which is starting now, to port. And it does uh, execute that no problem. There's very little motion throughout the entire veer. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but it did, did just fine. Here's the very end of that 180 degree veer. The camera tether does get captured and the camera starts pulling downward. Gives us a chance to see uh, exactly the motion relative to the seabed. And then I, that, that power reduction and then it increasing again, that's my signal that the, that the veer is over. And now I'm just pulling straight and increasing power. And above 500 pounds, this anchor never stops moving. It just keeps going uh, faster and faster. And uh, the, up at 690 pounds, the boat was moving two knots or more. So I, I cut things off at that point. Next is another veering test, this time in the sandy mud seabed. I have executed or conducted this test with all the other 40 to 50 pound range anchors. So we'll have good apples to apples comparisons. It is an all rope road with generous scope. I am, uh, the boat is uh, veering to starboard. Uh, by the way, the, uh, for all these tests, the road is attached to the transom. So when I say it's veering to starboard, assume the boat is aiming away from the anchor. And what I'm finding with this is the anchor remains buried throughout the veer, but it does have some a small amount of forward motion. So it's not as good as the very best anchors in the veer. And then when we straighten out and just pull straight ahead, the anchor has uh, quite a bit of motion. Again, it's, uh, there's anchors that do worse, but uh, the very best have almost no motion at this stage. Note that the anchor is listing and it's failing to right itself. It's also got a little bit of a trajectory. It, it, the anchor is sort of aiming one direction where the road is off in another. And I can tell you, I was very careful. The, the boat is not veering at this point. It is just pulling straight ahead. I have a theory, and I'm going to go into this more, especially on the workbench when we're done looking at the underwater footage. I believe there is a bit of asymmetry to the fluke. It's, you could almost call it a manufacturing flaw. And I believe it is responsible for this behavior that we are seeing. And I've got quite a bit more, more evidence to back that up. I'm not absolutely certain, but I, I think there is a, a flaw. And I was not expecting this much motion from the anchor. It, um, you know, it's, it's certainly not bad, but I, again, I was expecting it uh, to be a, a, little bit, a little bit more solid in its holding. If you recall from the 17 pound Mantis M2 veering test, it's a bit different. It's, it's less scope, but it uses a very heavy chain and you only uses 500 pound baseline thrust during the veer, but it had kind of a similar amount of motion 
at the same straight line pull. Um, well, okay, it was it was more motion, but it was kind of in the same ballpark. I just would have expected a, a 45 pounder to do much better. Took a lot of force to uh, extract from the seabed. And note that there is mud only up against one side of the shank. And that was the direction of the veer, which is understandable. That's going to have more mud compaction. We do have mud on the starboard side. That's the side of the veer. Nothing on this side. But I want you to take a look at the point of that red arrow. That location on the fluke is the exact spot of this manufacturing flaw that I mentioned. So make a note of that. There is a, a definite break in the mud line right at that little spot. Next is an exact repeat of the previous test. I, I felt there was a an, enough of a of enough movement there to warrant that maybe there was uh, an anomaly, maybe a uh, something we couldn't see under the seabed was affecting the anchor. I, I do that quite a bit. Whenever I get a result that just doesn't seem right, I go ahead and just retest it. And I'll, I'll either show you both of them or throw out uh, a really, really weird uh, result that I suspect uh, was influenced by, by, by some unique, unique factor. But I tell you, that's very rare. And so what we get is very similar behavior. It, it executed the veer pretty well. I think it did a little better on this one. Um, but we get the similar uh, situation. The anchor is listed a bit. It is not straightening out directly with the road. Uh, maybe there's a little bit less motion. I think around in the midpoint of this high power pull, it seems to slow down and almost stop, but then it picks up again. And I think you know, with a full minute and enough dragging, that should be plenty of time for this anchor to completely align itself with the road. Again, there's no sideways boat motion through this. I was very careful. Uh, there's, I, I just think there's asymmetry in the loading of the anchor. I can't explain exactly how this asymmetry is, is working. I can just see it. I just see that it's not straightening out. Once again, on retrieval, we see mud packed into the one side of the shank. Yes, that was the side of the veer, but there was a good minute of straight line pulling. You'd think we would have mud washed, uh, you know, perfectly symmetrically on either side. And once again, the trailing edge of that mud coincides perfectly with that slight manufacturing flaw that is only on that side of the fluke. Well, with those two previous starboard veers, well, I just had to do another one to port and see if we get a difference. And a difference we most certainly do see. Uh, the initial set, of course, was just fine. And through the veer, I think it's a little better. The very best anchors only move uh, less than an anchor length away from the initial setting track, and I think this is in that ballpark. Maybe a little bit more motion than the, the very finest anchors for this test. Those were the 45-pound spade and the 50-pound steel Excel. So I think that's a, that's a better veer than those previous starboard rotations. But the, the real difference is now in the straight line portion. The anchor never emerges. Uh, we have to assume it stays upright. There's very little motion. It is aligned nicely with the road. And this was the performance I was expecting from this anchor. Based on, based on the smaller 17-pounder, this is what I expected uh, all the time. And the fact that it only does this when you do it to port, eh, that's another piece of evidence for my theory that the anchor has some asymmetry that is negatively affecting 
performance. Note on retrieval, there is seabed up against the port side of the shank, but it falls away immediately. In fact, not once did this anchor emerge from the water with seabed attached to the port side of the fluke. Next is my 180 degree reset testing. I actually conducted this test 10 times for the short chain version and then another 10 times in the long chain condition. And uh, the reason I'm not going to show it all to you is it is very boring. This anchor just keeps doing the same thing. It's perfect. Uh, short chain resets result in a backflip virtually every time. And every time the anchor rotates and immediately reconnects with the seabed. It's beautiful. I do give the anchors a, a pretty good burst of power after they reset. It's over 500 pounds. But it's not quite the high power pulling as those veer tests, and indeed no seabed impacts into the fluke. And the last tests I'll show you in the water are some of those long chain 180 degree resets. And they're even more boring than the short chain because this condition results in the anchor just rotating in the seabed each and every time. It doesn't really move anywhere, just, just pivots around. That is as good as it gets. Okay, let's get right to this alleged flaw. Those red arrows that I gave you, they were pointing directly to this joint here. And what this is, is the interface between the forward cast part of the flute and the after plate section. There's a weld joint right between, and if I put a straight edge on here, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a gap between the straight edge and the forward part of the fluke surface. It's about an eighth of an inch. Also, if I put the fluke or the straight edge longer, now there's even a bigger gap. Now it's, gosh, a, a full quarter inch. So not only is there a variation in the actual joint here, the entire surfaces are not at the same plane. The other side is much better. The, the, the top and the, the, the top surfaces are at the same position. Plus, we put the straight edge on and there's just not nearly as much of a gap. If we look at the 17 pound M2 that I tested a couple weeks ago, it is dead flat, perfect alignment, both sides. I raved about this anchor. It dominated the field, really. It's, it, it worked better than much larger anchors, and I just had a wonderful feeling about it. The 45-pound version, just not as much. Part of that is because of the competition. Um, in the case of the 17-pounder, uh, against the 17-pound Excel, it really did a lot better because the, the small Excel had trouble in the soft mud. However, the big Excel, it does really well in the soft mud. So again, part of the reason this is not going to be at the top of my charts is because the competition did, did a bit better. But now this, this anchor, I, I was disappointed with that, that sandy mud veer, and I really think this is a, 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 a big reason for it. Remember that in all those retrievals, not once was there mud present on this side of the fluke. Each and every time there was mud, it was here. And it didn't matter if it was a, a veering test or whether the veer occurred in this direction or that direction. So there's no question that this was hanging up mud. Here's another piece of evidence that, that, that I think is applicable. This is a 45-pound Rockna anchor that I tested, oh, several months ago. And frankly, this was the worst performing anchor I've, I've ever tested in that sandy mud seabed. It was just truly awful. I noted a few flaws with it. The shank is not welded on correctly. It's off by as much as an inch that direction. Also, the anchor is secondhand and it looks old. This surface corrosion has a, a bit of texture to it. And when I got it, this wasn't smoothed out yet. So I believe mud was able to grab a hold of that roughness 
to a certain degree. Now, as you recall, I did my whole drilling trick and I pounded down the, the palm uh, flaps, if you will, and did get the anchor to work a little better. Uh, but there's another glaring flaw with this anchor and it's this weld bead. It's not ground flat. It, it's, this is how it was built at the factory and that is a significant bump. Certainly about uh, in, the, in the range of the same height as the flaw on this M2. But instead of being just a small portion of the fluke, it's all the way across both sides. So you can imagine how bad I want to grind this off and retest the anchor. However, it's not going to be a great test. I, nobody wants to see this modified Rockna. They want to see a genuine Rockna. So clearly I need to get another example, a, a good, clean, straight, uh, unmolested 45 pound rock now it's on my list uh, com compared to the 22 pound rock now that I bought it's it's quite new no 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 problems with the galvanizing it's very smooth these welds are smooth and flat and the shank is nice and straight and this anchor did much much better it's I mean it was still low compared to the best anchors but it was in the ballpark it would it would not mud foul every time I, it would reset okay it just had reduced holding power this anchor before I modified it it was just abysmal it, the first set was okay but after that it just really wouldn't work at all what to do with this anchor? I'm not inclined to pound this out or grind this down. I think I'm going to let Mantis, the, you know, they provided this anchor. So my, my policy is to not molest anchors unless I get the blessing from the person or persons who sent it. So I'll let them decide. Maybe this is within their tolerances and they're just going to say, hey, that's the way it is. Maybe they're going to say, hey, get that out of there and they'll send me a new fluke. Fine, I'll, I'll do whatever they want me to do. I'd like to clarify that all this talk about mud sticking to flukes applies to cohesive type seabeds only. Uh, loose sand or soft muds, other kinds of near liquid like seabeds, that's not really an issue because it, it, nothing can really have a three dimensional shape stuck to the anchor. Uh, so again, if you may have, you may love your rock now. Maybe you're in places with, with clean sand, maybe in the tropics, and it just always works. And you may be just looking cross-eyed at these, these mud tests where the anchors don't work, and, and you just don't know, it just doesn't apply to you. Well, that, that's why. Uh, it's, a, it's a cohesive type seabed is what we're talking about. Okay, flawed fluke or not, let's see how the M2 stacks up against the other anchors on the ranking chart. Uh, far right hand total average column, the M2, uh, second place, uh, 4.1, and only the Excel number 5 is better with a total score of 4.2. But if we look at the in water tested performance column, the M2 is not as powerful. Uh, three anchors are better the Viking 20, Excel number 5, and the 44 pound spade are all better in all around in water performance. Uh, note that the Ultra and the Mantis M1 tie the Mantis M2. So the, the, certainly the M2 is among the very best anchors, but it is not a challenge for in-water performance to the very best. Okay, overall it's a solid performance. It's a very good anchor. It wasn't quite the home run that the 17-pound M2 was in my view, uh, but, but very good nonetheless. Um, maybe my my theory about the the little flaw in the fluke, maybe it's for nothing, and this is as good as it gets. Maybe it could be a little better. All right, I want to thank everybody once again for watching and for donating. For those that haven't, and you want to keep these completely independent anchor tests coming, maybe you use my information to help you make your anchor purchase, uh, do consider throwing a few bucks my way. It all adds up. Uh, links to Patreon and PayPal in the description below. Thanks for watching. As always, anchor safely. And, uh, oh, before I go, next week it's the 45-pound Lumar Epsilon anchor. I know a lot of people have been anticipating that. I've actually got the testing all done. I just need to edit the video. Till then, so long.